all know that North Myrtle Beach is the place to be if you want to experience our state dance, Shag. And we all know that before 1968, the name North Myrtle Beach didn't even exist. But here are some facts I bet you didn't know. We had uh, the war, of course, and, and we, uh, I remember some of the students, we were uh, asked to come in and help with the rationing of the kerosene and, and shoes and sugar and that sort of thing. And uh, they selected a few of us out of the senior class to, uh, to do that job. And it was quite, a, quite interesting. I met this um, colored lady that uh, I knew and she said, I can't buy all of these sugar. She thought she had the stamps, she had to buy the sugar, you know, but it wasn't the case. You could pass it on to somebody else and they could get the sugar. But anyway, she said, I can't afford to buy all of this sugar. What must I do with it? I said, well, let me have some of your stamps. <laughs> Another thing I remember about those old days is Mr. O.B. Strickland had a little grocery store in the dairy hut up the street, and behind it he had a bunch of tables set up and grills where people could go rent a spot and clean their fish and fry their fish and eat them right there. Three bucks they could, they could rent a space to fix their fish with. You could go down on the beach when the fishermen were down there pulling in the, their nets, and you could buy the fish. Uh, right there and then. I think that was before DHEC. <laughs> but you could buy them by the pound or buy them by the bucket full, I don't remember. But they'd buy those fresh fish and take them up to Mr. Strickland's place, fry them and eat them. And that was tr tradition. People come to the beach, not to go to the ocean, but to come down here and catch the f eat the fish and fill their bellies, I guess. But... I've seen a lot of changes because all the roads were dirt then or, or cocaine and all the buildings. I remember we were, Daddy's garage, he probably got a telephone in 47, 48, somewhere along there, right before the 50s, and um, you were on party lines then. We were on party line with uh, Baldwin, Jimmy Baldwin's hardware, and our number was 2512, I believe, and his was 2513. <laughs> and so if you picked up the phone and he was on it, you'd have to hang it back up and to give him time to complete his. And if you wanted to call him from your phone, you'd have to dial nine, and then you would dial the last digit of his number, the last digit of your number, and you pick it up and you would hear a busy signal and then you lay it down, and you wait a little while, and pick it up, giving them time to make the connection, and they will be somebody on the line. <laughs> you know, when we were surveying oceanfront property in, in the 70s, it was probably worth $200 a foot. Now it's probably worth $20,000 a foot, or maybe more than that. So the accuracy is, depend. you know, you can't just assume anything anymore. So because you have to be liable for it for the rest of your life. So, you know, we, we've, we've seen it go from, I've seen land that I used to survey, used to charge $50 to survey a lot. Now that same lot costs $500. It's not because the lot changed, it's because that same lot that we surveyed $50 was worth $500. Now it's worth a half a million dollars. Cherry Grove lots, you know, I mean, I bought two of them in 1960s for $4,500 a piece. And now they're $450,000 a piece. So, you know, you change, you change with, the, with, the, with the prices. Oh, it was just the desolation, basically. I mean, between Ocean Drive and Cherry Grove, the beach was just basically wiped clean. Uh, you could stand on the beach, and, and the beach didn't end until you got to the road. I mean, it was just, just smooth sand all the way back. Uh, you got into, into um, Ocean Drive itself, there were some houses left, but, but what was left wasn't worth a whole lot. Uh, a lot of them were, you know, had fallen over, they were basically piles of board, etc. You go up Cherry Grove, 
Um, the cherry grove was hit very, very hard too. There was a few buildings left up there. The old Cherry Grove Manor, I can remember, was just basically tilted over almost on its side. Um, it was interesting because uh, Cherry Grove, a lot of people don't realize the East Cherry Grove, or what, I don't know whether they call it East Cherry Grove or not anymore, but what the, the far end of Cherry Grove, the northernmost end, um, was actually an island at one point in time. It was Hog Island, and there was an inlet up there. Uh, and the inlet got washed back through again during Hazel and had to redredge and fill it back up again. Uh, so yeah, there was actually, I remember that, there was two islands. It was Hog Island and Waiters Island just north of that. But yeah, it was, it was real desolation. I mean, if you lived back up on the hill, as they called it, which was back um, a couple blocks, then you were probably okay with the water didn't get to you, but uh, anybody within reach of the water was pretty well wiped out. Oh, well, we raised corn and tobacco, plowed with mules. Uh, the tobacco was the main money crop. Uh, we raised hogs. You, we had uh, raised our own beef. And hey, back then, uh, you, they did a lot of bartering. Uh, somebody would kill us beef and he'd trade you, give you a quarter. And then when he killed the hogs, you know, they they would just trade. Uh, it was kind of like growing up on the farm. Uh, your neighbor would help you gather tobacco. When he gathered, you go, there was no money passed. Uh, I, I cropped a bracker, never got a dime for it because it's always trading with the neighbors. At one time, Poplar Community, there were some huge trees, Poplar trees, on a man's farm named Waterman Leviston and H. T. Watts and Mr. Jet Todd, Jet Todd, that's all I knew. And those trees was huge. And I was told that the name of the place, Poplar, was named after those trees. And in fact, I have some poplars on some property I secured later you know, on that same ditch, ditch row. Walt Piaz was according to some reading came from that's an Indian name along with the Waccamaw River. A large tribe of Indians used to roam in that area, in that vicinity, so I was told. Getting back to the politics, uh, everybody was democratic and then when Johnson came along and and changed the Great Society and it upset people and forced integration in all parts of society, um, the Republican Party had a chance and it became that the old time office holders like me stayed with the party and uh, uh, there was a white flight from the Democratic Party with Lyndon Johnson, a white flight from the party and uh, those of us that stayed tried to change it thinking that was what uh, we could bring about some harmony it, it didn't work. The uh, awful lot of the talent that we were Democrats, I thought, became Republicans and started defeating us, started beating us. And uh, when James Edwards, who was a state senator uh, from Charleston, uh, when I was in the legislature, he was there and uh, good land. All of a sudden, James Edwards senator is James Edward governor, Republican. I mean, it was just unheard of. We were aghast. We had no idea what was going on, and we didn't handle it well. It was called the Lugar Motel at Windy Hill. It's the first three-story building that went up right on the ocean front. And uh, it was really beautiful. In 1968, we won the uh, deck prize for the whole strand because it was 
It was all brick. It was designed beautifully. It had palm trees, and that was a 1968 award. So I was real proud of that. And it was right, the pool area was right in front of the house that we had built in 1951. So it was a pretty view, you know, the view from, from the house. And that's where I ran the motel from, the living room of the house. 1915, 1916, my grandfather purchased about 700 acres in, in what is today Windy Hill, which was a pretty much all of, Wind, of what Windy Hill. He owned from the ocean to the waterway, uh, even though the waterway wasn't there then. And with that piece of land is where I first had my, my encounter with North Myrtle Beach, or in this case, well, Windy Hill. And at the time, I would visit my grandmother and I believe she had the only house on Windy Hill. Uh, she's sitting, sitting in the middle of 700 acres with this little beach house, not on the, not on the ocean, but, but back from the ocean. And we were still living in Conway, and I was probably six, maybe seven, five, six, seven years old. And to go visit her, we caught the mail, the uh, mail delivery car, uh, and we would ride over with the mailman and my uh, grandmother, or in this case my cousin, would meet me at the mailbox, and we would walk to my grandmother's uh, home. Two years later, he came home one day, and he says, well, I bought the pier today. I said, you did what? He said, well, it was in the coffee shop, and I won't say who the other person was, but it was somebody else talking about buying it, and and said that, um, he said, he told me he wasn't paying no 5% interest, that he just wouldn't take it. And he never said, I just calmly said, are you sure you're not going to take it, you don't want it? Said, no, mm -mm, I don't take it. So he told the guy, he says, well, I'll take it then. They pulled out a napkin from the table and they wrote the agreement on the napkin. And you know that's a, a legal document if it was signed and all. So he said, I knew if I didn't go ahead and get that then, I might never get it. So he would got it on a napkin, and that's how he bought the pier. <laughs> and, you know, it was a good, good thing that we did because we had a lot of good years there and still enjoying it, of course. Uh, these hurricanes didn't help any, but, you know, we survived. So as you can see, we're hard at work documenting history for the future North Myrtle Beach Area Historical Museum. And here's one more fact. We need you. Come join us in our effort to preserve North Myrtle Beach Area history.